My name is Maria Barnes. I am the chapter president of Access Users Group Lunchtime Chapter. Um, if you, if this is the first time you've joined us, we have a free monthly webinar that then gets recorded and posted to YouTube. Hold it the last Tuesday of every month at 12 noon Central Time. So, um, you know, catch catch us in the future. Um, let me post a link here to our group and the lunch, uh, the calendar so that you can reference that. So that link that I posted was uh, our calendar. And um, today's meeting is going to be presented by Peter Cole. He is the director of Theme My Database. And we're going to be talking today about VB Watchdog, which is an error handler from Everything Access. All right, are you ready, Peter? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Maria. Um, I'm going to be talking about VB Watchdog. It's a product from uh, Everything Access. We'll just take a very quick look at their website. And we can see they have a number of other things that they do. They do conversion services uh, from ACCDE to ACDDB. I believe that's a unique service. They can fix a broken access uh, database. And they've got VB Watchdog, which is the one we're going to be talking about today. All right, for clarity, I have no association with the developers for VB Watchdog. It's just so good, I felt that other users should know about it. They've not provided me anything free or even at a reduced price. I'm just an enthusiastic user. So we'll start off looking at the traditional handler. We can see that we've got an error in here and we've got our error procedure with a message box which is giving the error number, the description and what module and what subroutine it's running in. So if we press F5 now we're going to see the number, the description, and where it was. If we break out of that, we can go into the code, and then we're at the resume line after the message box. We'll just comment that, and then we'll step through. And by doing the resume, we've gone back, and we can see highlighted in yellow the line which caused the error. Well, Look at a slightly more complex example, which has got multiple levels, one procedure calling another, calling another. And we'll run this one. Again, we see the information that we just saw, but a different procedure this time. And that keeps repeating because we've got a resume in there. If we take that out, which will be the normal procedure, and continue then it's finished. We'll now look at a sample with no error trapping. Very similar, but we're taking the traps out. Division by zero. And that's come to the line with the error in it. And we'll go to this one. And we'll run that. The debug. And the where the error is has been now highlighted in yellow. And we'll now see what Watchdog can do for us. So we're going to enable Watchdog and we're going to use the standard version. Because we're using a trial version of Watchdog, we see a nag screen which reminds us that it's a trial and that we should probably buy a license if we want to use it. So we're now going to look at the no handlers version. And we're going to run, and this time we're seeing our watchdog error message. So this has got an awful lot more detail. It's saying what uh, database we're running in, what the module is, and what the routine is that we're running. It's actually telling us the name of the uh, database and its path as well. We've got an error number. We've got the source line number. And we've got the actual source and when we actually had the error occurring. So we can ignore and continue. And that will just do a resume next. 
we run that again, we debug the source code, it will jump straight to the line where the error was. Ah, nothing too special about that. But if we look up here, we'll see toggle line numbers. We can see it was line number four. Let's reset that. And we're going to add a few extra lines. You can see the line numbering is automatically updating. Now, if we run that again, we'll see now that our error is on line eight. So we can debug the source code. It's jumped down to there. We reset again. If we take some lines out, because we've done some more editing, we run again. We'll see. It's jumped back to line four. So without having to put anything uh, in, in terms of line numbers, Watchdog has given us the line numbers that we are needing or where the error occurs. I'm already sold after watching the first part of it. Uh, yeah, I, I purchased a different tool to add line numbers in my code. MZ Tools has the line number in there as well. Which yeah, is that's the I one. I, I got my own error okay. handler, but I yeah, use I the undocumented VBA.ERL to grab the line number once the lines are numbered. Yeah, but I, I don't put line numbers in my development copy, and then I just add them before I go to test mode because otherwise kind of a pain to keep undoing and redoing and that kind of stuff. We'll change the name of the routine. So I call it 200. If we run that again, we'll see now that in our source, our routine is now 200 and not the two it was previously. So Watchdog has dynamically read the new name of the routine. We're going to look at the slightly more complex example. Run. This time, we're going to look at more info. And what we're getting here is the call stack. This is showing how we arrived at the error with all the preceding procedures. The error is actually in this one, but it passed through this one and this one. Now we will look at a more complex example with some variables. So if we run this, we have an error again. So we can look at the more info. We've got the call stack, but we've also got a show variables. And this is now showing the variables which are set, which are in the local procedure, a parameter, and we've got a module level variable in here. And this is the value of that, that variable at this given moment in time. So if we look here, we can see there's our module variable. And this is where we set it. So Watchdog has picked up the errors, the procedure name, the module name, the order of the procedures which were run through to get to the error, and the variables at the moment in time when the error occurred and their values. With Watchdog, without adding any code to our subs or functions, all the errors are trapped. We're automatically provided with the module and the function name at the moment, regardless of previous edits. Watchdog is also providing a call stack of procedures leading to the error and the values of all the variables in the call stack. It works with runtime as well. Obviously, you don't see the actual code of what's uh, caused the error in an ACCDE, but you will see the line number, so you'll be able to go back to your source and see. You may well be thinking about uh, tracking errors that we anticipate. You can use the standard on error go to procedure in Watchdog, and it will recognize the error, and it will use your error handler without any problems. Watchdog does include an alternative system called try-catch. It simplifies the process. The try part is the code of the routine, and it's followed by optional catch statements. 
We'll look at the watchdog try catch. And we can see up here we've got some errors. The first catch is on an error number 11. And it's quite obvious, it just catches the error number 11. You can have up to four numbers on any catch, and you can have as many catch statements as you require. We'll run this and we'll step through with F8 and see what Watchdog is doing. We've got an error, and Watchdog is passing to our global error handler. It's now going to work out where this error came from. It's just going to do its initialization. You'd only see this once. And now it's going to get the state of the error. And these are the various options of how an error can be handled in the code. It's on our error go to zero, onto a label, propagate, when you haven't got a local handler in the routines causing the error. We're on to the error catch. And it was a caught error, so it exits the select. And now we're going to see the error message that is written into the catch statement. We can continue, and it will resume to the next error. No initialize this time. And we've got our catch, and it's going to exit and jump through this. We'll now run through to this one. It's got our message. And now we've got an error which doesn't appear in either of the catch statements. So this is going to be a catch all, where it's handling errors which aren't specifically caught by numbers. So we're going to get our catch all message. So if in your code you needed to do some kind of handling on all errors, then this is where you'd put your handling. And then we've got into a finally, which is where you put cleanup code. So if you had um, to close some files or some record sets or turn off an hourglass or put set warnings back on, then you can do that in the finally. If there is an error in there, like it tries to close something which isn't open, then it will ignore that. So you don't need to do checking because Watchdog's going to handle that part for you. It's getting the state, moving through the and inside the catch. And it's the resume next. Using catch, they're all optional. So you can do a catch specific number, or you can do a catch all, or a catch finally. Well, it's just finally, not catch finally, for cleanup code. Unlike a standard error handler, there is no need to have an exit sub or exit function and resume. So the code looks a lot cleaner because it runs from top to bottom. To obtain VB Watchdog, we go to the everythingaccess.com website. We can see they offer conversion services, repair services, and VB Watchdog, which is the one that we're interested in. It's the error handling system that we've just seen. We see an example of the dialog box, as we saw in our testing, and we can see a number of features which we've been through. We can download a trial version, which is free, or we can pay for a license. We see the benefits, that there's no uh, DLLs to add, and it's royalty-free licensing. We can download, clicking the download link, and we've got versions for 64-bit windows and 32-bit windows. The 64-bit version works for 32-bit access and 64-bit access. 
we click for downloading the zip version then we'll save the file and once it's finished downloading we'll have the zip in our downloads folder if we open it we'll see that there's an MSI in there we can drag that to a convenient location and then we can right click and install and run on the security of message and then we accept the terms of the license agreement and then we finish we open an access database and the VB editor and if we look in the add-ins we'll see that VB Watchdog has been added we can add Watchdog to this project by clicking that will add five class modules and all we need to do is save it then we're ready to use Watchdog so now we have got a copy of Watchdog a trial installed what do we do next to get started? Well, I've put a form together to help us uh, see what's going on. And uh, we're going to enable Watchdog, enable standard. If we view the code, we'll see what we need to do to get Watchdog running. This code has all been taken from a sample database, which comes from Everything Access. So we have two parts. We have a setup dialogues, which tells us the format of the display messages. And we have the enabling of Watchdog. All the Watchdog uh, commands begin with E-R-R-E-X. And what we're using here is a routine called on error, which has nothing to do with uh, the on error go to in uh, normal access. So we'll ignore this one here. If we look in setup dialogues, we'll see that there's a lot of HTML in here, which you can modify manually, change titles, change colors, and uh, descriptions on buttons. The sample from Everything Access actually has a visual interface to be able to generate all of this code for you. So you, things which aren't obvious, you can get the uh, GUI to do it. So error X enable enables the global error trap. We go back here. We can view our global error trap code. So we, we've seen this before when we were running through the try catch. This is what uh, Watchdog is going to run through every time. It finds where the error came from, the state, and then we can handle things in the uh, whichever manner we choose. We can store the error messages in a table and we can send that uh, information via email. And we'll jump to have a look at the log to table. So we open a record set and we store the time, the number, the description, and then the call stack which is uh, all the uh, routines which have been passed through. This is picking up the information from Watchdog. So everything which Watchdog displays on its screen is accessible to VBA. So you can do what you like with it to make things uh, easier to use. There is even a very simple example of sending uh, via email the error log. To make it easy to add Watchdog to a, another database, I've added a copy to other database function. We'll go and create a new database called test. So totally blank. We won't do anything with it yet. We're going to copy the required uh, objects to our new database. Here we've got test. We'll say OK. And in a few seconds, it will say it's copied over for us. So we now open the test database. 
and we'll see we've got a few objects in here. We've got the watchdog modules and we've got some forms. We'll open this form and this will allow us to open the watchdog standard that we've seen before. This button runs our enable watchdog routine. And this is a trial version. So we're going to continue trial and then we're just going to test. And there we go. We see that we've got an error message in here with the watchdog dialog box. And there's our routine causing the error. And as we've seen before, we've jumped to the line with the error in. If we go back to make it easy to enable watchdog, I've created an auto exec. We can rename this to just auto exec. Exit and go back in again. And it's loading watchdog, so it's given us our nag screen. And we don't need to enable it because it's already done. So now you could delete the forms and the other auto exec and use watchdog in this project. We'll close the test. We're now going to look at what else we can do with watchdog. We can use alternative displays for users and developers. So obviously a developer will want to see a lot of information. A user will just want to see uh, something went wrong, uh, press here to continue. So we've got a developer version. And if we run our with variables routine, we'll now see that we've got a slightly different version of the error box. We've got it slightly wider and we've got rid of a one or two buttons, which were the standard buttons. We still have the functionality of the call stack. Now we look at the, the user version and we'll run our with variables again. This time we've got a much reduced message box and we're saying, yeah, don't worry, because the developer knows something's happened. So we could uh, email off the error message or store it for later use. We've got an ignore and continue. We've also at the moment got a close in here in case there's a, a, a never ending routine and ignore and continue. We just go round and round and round in circles. Don't want the users to have to press break, but we'll ignore and continue. So we'll just have a look at the code that we've used for this. So we've set up a, a slightly different um, function to enable Watchdog. We've got the setup two level dialogue and we give it a parameter of either one for developer or something else for, for user. And if we go into setup, we've got just a simple if. If it's level one, do that. If it's level two, do that. We use the same error trapping routine for the global error handling. Now it's possible that you might not like the display of the dialog boxes or you might find they don't contain quite enough information. So you can use a standard access form for error messages as an alternative. I've put some examples here. So we'll use an enhanced form We've got a developer form, and if we run with variables, we'll now see that we have a form, which has got a bit more information, perhaps simpler to see. So we've got the call stack, and the line which actually caused the error, we've highlighted in red, and then lines which it passed through to get there, 
we've highlighted in green. We've also provided uh, some information about whether we've sent it to IT and some other information down here on the computer and the version of software, which can sometimes be useful for tracking the errors. We ignore and continue and we're back where we were. We're now going to look at the user form version of it. So we're going to select user form and look at our routine again and run the error. This time we've got much more limited information. Again, too much for a user, but this is just to prove how we can have separate forms for both user and developer. And we've got continue because perhaps saying ignore, they might get put off. We're going to have a look at the code for the developer. And so we've got enable and we've got uh, a parameter, one for developer, two for user. And we've chosen to use two different error traps to make life simpler. We could make one error trap and do some ifs, but it's just easier to have two separate ones. So in our developer trap, we're going to say that if the error is anything but an on catch error, where we know exactly what we're doing, then we're going to log that to a table. We'll have a look at the routine. Log to table. We're just opening up a record set and we're putting in the variables. And these are some which you could add yourself for other functions, useful information. This has been done for a developer that I'm working with who wants all this extra information to help him debug. So we've got the call stack information, same as we saw in the standard routine. We're calling the call stack. It's slightly more complicated so that we can get the hex in to give the colors. We're going to create another test database so that we can add the form error message boxes to the new database. So we'll create an access database. And then we will copy to other database. And this time we're going to use copy forms. It's copied. Now we can close that and we'll open our test forms database, very similar to the previous one that we looked at. We've got an enable and we've got enable watchdog forms. So we'll test our watchdog running. We'll now enable watchdog. We've got our trial screen nagging box. Now, if we test, we will see that we're getting the error forms that we had before. So this is just an easy method of adding Watchdog to your database, either a new or existing one. We'll end there. Again, we have a an auto exec, which you can use, or alternatively, you can use the routines from the command buttons to enable watchdog. So we can add watchdog to a new database and start off using catches and adding no error trapping from the traditional sense because watchdog will catch every error and uh, process it for you. But if we're adding to existing database, then we need to do possibly some modifications because if the traditional trap error trapping has been picking up messages, you won't see the watchdog message boxes. You can, however, log all the errors because all errors are going through watchdog regardless of any error trapping. So we can log 
we're going to have a look at traditional ones. Now, if we look at this, we'll run the test with global and it's picking up there. So we're not seeing a watchdog message. So that was an error 13. To get watchdog to display its message, we will comment that line and we'll add this call to call global error handling. We'll run this again. And this time you'll see that we've got the form error log and we were in the user mode. So that's what we are seeing. If we switch back to the form and use developer, go back to our error handlers, we will now see the developer version of the form so we can switch backwards and forwards. So if we need to make some modifications, then we will need to change and add this line to existing error handlers when they are catching non-specific error numbers. We will look at a real example of updating to Watchdog using a sample of the old Northwind database. We have a test version of Northwind for test ACC DB where forms, categories, products and report invoice have been suffixed with one so that it will cause errors. We will copy Watchdog using copy to other database and copy dialog objects. OK. We will close and exit and open Northwind for test. We will try categories. We see an error message saying that categories is misspelled. We look at products, we get a similar error message. We'll open the enable watchdog form and enable watchdog standard. Click through the continue trial and we'll just test watchdog to prove that it's running. Ignore and continue. We'll try categories again. Even though Watchdog is running, we've still got exactly the same error message. Products gives the same as well. This shows that Watchdog is using existing error traps, proving your database will continue to work with no modification. The point to remember is that Watchdog is processing all the errors so that you can log them. The Watchdog dialog is not displayed as the routines have a built-in handler. We'll try opening orders and printing the invoice and we'll see we've got an error message there. We open the enable watchdog form again and just test the watchdog running and proves that it is still running. We're going to open the form Find module and procedure. This is showing the error log, but has collected the errors together, grouping them by the procedure name and the line number. We can see we have two uses of test WD running. At the end of the form, we can see that we've got three options for storing to the clipboard. We've got a catch, an old style, which is a call global error handler, or the line of the code which caused the error. If we click view code, the module will open in the procedure which has the error in it. We move to just above the end, and if we click Control and V, it will paste in a catch with the error number and a message box that we can modify to give an appropriate amount of detail. And then it's got to resume next. We'll save that. 
go back to our form enable watchdog and click test watchdog running we see that it's done a catch we've got the message box rather than the dialog boxes from watchdog we go back to our modify traps for watchdog and we'll see that error 2102 it's got one occurrence and it's got a message it has an existing error trap we'll use old style call global error handler we'll then view code and we can see the error trap open forms and we've got a resume exit so if we click here and we press Control and V, it will insert what we call Global Error Handler. We don't want to see the existing message box, so we can delete that and then save. Now, if we call our categories, we'll see that we've got the Watchdog Error Message Box, or if we call Products. Again, we have the watchdog error message box. We go back to our updating form and we look at the error number 2103. We'll view the code. We'll see we've got 2501 trapped and we've got an else for all other error messages. We'll click here and paste again and then remove the error description save it go back into the form and if we click print invoice we'll now see that we've got our watchdog error message box we'll go to our enable watchdog and we will click Enable Watchdog Standard Developer. We'll see the developer form. It's wider and it's got less control buttons. Products will give the same. And now we'll enable Watchdog Standard User. And we see that we have our user dialog box. We will now rename our categories one form to categories and products one form to products and now we see our categories and our products. We have demonstrated that when Watchdog is enabled, existing error traps continue to function. Watchdog is logging all the errors. Using Find, Module and Procedure, we can jump to the routine where the error has occurred and update the code either with a catch or call Global Error Handler. The developer or user dialogues are displayed depending on which is set when Watchdog is enabled. As you have seen, VB Watchdog is a new, uniquely powerful system for adding error handling. It provides information that other systems are not able to deliver, such as the call stack and variable values. It is so comprehensive that the online manual can be overwhelming. One enthusiast who's been using Watchdog for years recently said he had forgotten just how long it took him to get started. Our aim was to provide a method to implement Watchdog with the minimum number of clicks and no coding. The database you have been seeing during this webinar is available for download. You should be able to implement Watchdog in a newer existing database using less than 10 clicks. You need to download and run the installation from Everything Access's website to be able to see the line numbers in your code.
If you have a question, feel free to ask a question. There was one that I caught during the presentation. Klaus has BB Watchdog already, but he would be interested in your demo database. Is that right. something that you plan to make available or not? It is, it is yes. Okay, and what, what we'll do with that is Peter will send that to me and then I, within the Access Lunchtime website, there's a blog post area. I will attach that to the blog post area and it'll probably be a zip file. There is something I have forgotten, which might be of interest, which is uh, a, a discount for people who are looking at the webinar or looking at the um, recording a little bit later. It's discounted prices. So it's this HTTPS. Okay. All right. I think I just put it in the chat. I love it. Hopefully I, I typed right. When you link the add-in, does it then pull in the modules from the add-in, and then that's how you were viewing them? Is that what happens? No, they are actually embedded within your database. They do become embedded. Okay. Yeah, and that, so that's... you could modify, when you say one form for one database and then another one for another. Ah, uh, yeah, the form. Database. The, the forms, yeah, the form is different. Yeah, the form can be whatever you want for. Yes, yeah, so you just generate your own form. Then you use the class modules to get the data that you need onto that form. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Um, I personally use just a database, which just contains the code I want to add to the new uh, database and yeah. just put it inside. So it's, it's rather easy either to say first add the, uh, the code with the, uh, with the main database you have, you have on, on the right side, you have, uh, um, on the menu, you can say, add, uh, the code. Uh, and then I, I add the things, uh, from my demo database into the new one. The, the, the everything access website has masses of background information um very detailed quite quite daunting to start with to be honest because it is such a powerful thing and he's suggesting a, a number of ways of actually implementing it for multiple uh, things in library files and then using the library file with the watchdog in it called by multiple other databases and you can use Watchdog within add-ins as well. And it shouldn't argue with them. You should be able to have it in twice, once in the add-in and once in the actual database. So it's it's pretty comprehensive. So I think this is super exciting. Lots of information. Like I didn't even know you could get the call stack in access. So this you, this is really cool. You can't tell um, VB yeah. Watchdog. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> The, the one thing I want to mention is uh, I do have a client that is concerned about um, some of the security certifications and stuff like that. So for, for that particular client, for instance, I can pop up a message that there has been an error and it's been reported to IT, but yeah, to yeah. the user, I can't display any other information. That's like a violation. They, right. they, they don't want them to know where what line number or what part or you know you don't want to give them any information that they might be able to use to get into the logistics of anything so but yep. to be able to display one message a generic one from them and then record in a table what all the details are so i can debug i think that's huge yeah yeah and of course you can send that table off you can email that uh, to yourself automatically which is uh, what we're doing Had that for a few years now. Our next stage is to, uh, because of a uh, project we're working on, which has sensitive data in, is to actually encrypt that 
file before we email it across to us. I personally have a form which, uh, as you say, has no no uh, idea of the content of the of the bug, but store the the file the error and the oh, that there are two two tables uh, error and help me uh, which is the uh, second table the error table and the error oh, background table I don't know the name. And uh, I, I look at in, in SQL server. Just yeah. uh, have, have the files in the SQL server and look them there. So no user can uh, look at it. Yeah, that's what I do. And I actually have a trigger on that SQL table. So when a record gets added, then I get an email via SQL about it. But, you know, it's not an email that the user could look at their sent messages or anything and see um, what's going on. With Watchdog, of course, you can have all the information from all the variables, which is incredibly useful, isn't it? Yeah, it speeds up tracking, you know. I always say I can't fix the error unless I can reproduce it. And that's sometimes the the biggest issue, right? Yeah, the users just won't tell you enough or they don't know enough. Um, well, because they're just... I, I don't know about you, but I get some that, um, you know, I don't know if you want to call it fog or, or what, but they, they'll just click through error messages and, oh, it, well, it still seems to work. Well, I would like to hear about those so that I can fix them or know about them and not just assume it's working because something's not working. Obviously, <laughs> well, that's that's the thing, of course, with which watchdog you can log absolutely everything. Because in our globe handler, is if you wanted to record absolutely everything, you could stick this log error to table back outside of the case, even if they're handled. So you then know that people have got past things which you've trapped. You get a flood of information, but uh, you could then filter it out. So you, you wouldn't have that situation which you just described where they, they've just clicked through it because at least you'd know that they've clicked through it a hundred times in the last week. This global error handler is a starting point and you can manipulate it accordingly. And there are also things about the uh, propagation of errors up a stack. That's got lots of pages on the website to tell you about it. All right, well, there's no other questions. Last minute call for questions, anyone? Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Maria. Wayne is brilliant. It's an amazing, amazing product. Thank you so much, Peter. This was very informative, and we really appreciate you spending time today going through this and letting us know some of the things that this awesome tool can do. Well, it's been uh, it's really real fun. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.